There was a July 2021 New York Times article on Agihelm, this drug. It was approved by the FDA, and this thing attacks amyloids. And there is a, there's, just briefly explain, what's an amyloid? So 115 years ago, when Dr. Alzheimer's defined what Alzheimer's disease is, he saw two things happening in the brain. One is the accumulation of huge numbers of what he called plaques, which we now know is formed of this little tiny peptide called beta amyloid, which is sticky and has formed giant clumps. Uh, in the brain. And the second thing he discovered were tangles uh, within the neurons that caused them to not be able to fire properly anymore. Uh, And so amyloid, the plaques, have been proposed to be the problem that starts off this disease. Um, And the the drug tried to remove those plaques. So just stop you there. So what they found in the brain was amyloids or plaques and tangles. And we knew that they were associated with Alzheimer's disease, that they were characteristic of Al- Alzheimer's, but we did not know that whether they were a cause. That's, that's the next step. Do, do the yeah. plaques that we find in the brains of deceased Alzheimer's patients actually cause Alzheimer's? And that's a much bigger leap. And even right at this moment, we don't know the answer, but th- that's where our story's going. That's right. So in the early 90s, um, during the genetic revolution, when we started understanding the genetics of some rare forms of Alzheimer's disease, this became a leading theory that the plaques themselves were the the driver, the thing that starts uh, the process of neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so this drug, Adjuhelm, um, which was by Biogen, the drug maker, was supposed to address these plaques. And yet a bunch of doctors, including yourself, were very critical of this, saying the proof is not there that it does that. And the proof is not there that the, the costs are outweighed by the benefits. Now, as I understand it from the New York Times article, the FDA approved this drug despite a council of senior agency officials resoundingly agreeing two months earlier at the FDA there was not enough evidence that this drug worked. And they wanted another clinical trial. They said otherwise people could be harmed. But then on June 7th of 21, FDA greenlit the drug anyway, scathing rebuke from Alzheimer's disease experts like you, calls for an investigation into how that thing got approved. It cost $56,000 a year, this drug. And the FDA just defended itself, saying we didn't lower our standards. Uh, Look, we subjected it to what's called accelerated approval, where serious disease is faced with very few treatment options. It's basically like, you know, the long shot, the Hail Mary. And the drug flopped. Okay, so you were one of the scientists pulled in on there, and you again spoke honestly and said serious questions, serious questions. And then a different group of scientists, I think, or maybe it's the same, mm-hmm. came back to you about a different drug made by Cassava Sciences. Is that how you pronounce? Correct. Okay. Cassava Sciences. This mm-hmm. one was called Samuphilum. Samuphilum. Yeah. Samuphilum. Okay. <laughs> now this one. Once again, these scientists are concerned. They look, it's got similar problems in that the early results seemed a little suspect. The FDA approved it to go forward to be tested in human beings. And and these scientists were concerned that people were going to be harmed. This drug company was worth nearly five billion bucks last summer. So they were doing pretty darn well. And they wanted someone like you to take a hard look at that drug and see if if in fact it should be used to treat Alzheimer's. So that's where our story really starts to begin. So tell us what happened of note while you were taking a look at that drug. So this is outside of my work with Vanderbilt University. I was contracted by an attorney representing a number of scientists who had concerns that the data uh, that was used to justify moving this drug into clinical trials uh, had a, a pattern of artifacts in it that was concerning. And then one raised concerns that perhaps there was some uh, manipulation of the data um, or, or research misconduct. And I was asked to come in and independently look at their concerns and to look at the papers uh, more broadly and and give another independent voice um, regarding what the the basic science data looked like. And what we found was a pervasive pattern of these red flags. There's some limitations about what you can say just from 
published information. And so it's very hard to conclusively uh, state that there's a fraud or that there's misconduct there, but certainly there is a pervasive pattern of, of things you wouldn't expect in the data. And I think journalists and photographers uh, look at a lot of the visual um, images the same way we do. The data um, that this company was producing ends with a photograph of an experiment and the photographs just didn't look natural. Um, and that was the starting point for us to say perhaps this needed a closer look and that some regulatory bodies should um, make a priority to review this, especially with patients being exposed to the drug. So how does a doctor named Sylvain Lesney appear in your world in this t- time? Well, it's almost happenstance. Uh, at the time, um, I was looking at... Um, ways of doing a forensic analysis on these images. And um, I encountered his paper um, partly because it, uh, it was a prominent paper, um, but some, some people who do research integrity work had flagged a couple of his other lower profile papers. Um, and I, you know, it just caught my eye that the images in his paper look similar to the ones I had been investigating. And just like I said previously, didn't look natural. They sort of had the kinds of things that, um, you know, look like Photoshop type changes in them. Mm. And that prompted me to take a closer look, especially because as I reviewed his body of work, a number of his works were uh, enormously influential. So his name, again, Sylvain, I don't know how you pronounce it, to be honest, uh, Lesney, L-E-S-N-E, French guy, neuroscientist, associate professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, and he had sort of the, the mentorship of a very important doctor named Dr. Karen Ash, who's also a neuroscience scientist and professor at the University of Minnesota. She's a full, full professor. So this guy, Dr. Lesney, the French guy, but he's here in America, you start to see some of the images that he's been using in papers that he's been putting out over the past couple of decades. And they look, as my 11-year-old daughter would say, sus. They look sussy baka, as she might explain. And um, you start to dig a little deeper. And this guy, along with his mentor, Dr. Karen Ash at the University of Minnesota, are the authors of the seminal study from 2006 on Alzheimer's and what causes it. And in particular, you know, we'll get it to exactly what their theory was. But basically that paper that they wrote in 2006 has been like the genesis of studies on what causes Alzheimer's and what, how we should treat Alzheimer's ever since. And they've gotten billions of dollars in funding to pursue this line of research and so on. And what you said was the 2006 study they did together has got equally problematic images to the ones I found Dr. Lesney using in virtually every study he's been attached to ever since. Yeah, that's right. The 2006 was an interesting moment for the amyloid hypothesis because uh, it was one of the times when it was coming under the hardest scrutiny because the first clinical trials had started to fail. And so this, the hypothesis was starting to be reformulated to focus on something called an oligomer. Instead of saying that the whole clump of sticky beta amyloid protein was the problem, they assumed that before you had a giant clump, you must have had a very small clump that the that group together to form these plaques. And these very small clumps we call oligomers have become the focus of a lot of Alzheimer's research because they think this is what's actually conferring the toxicity that's damaging the neurons. And they, this study was very influential at advancing that hypothesis. Okay, so, so what they did together at the University of Minnesota back then, 2006, as I understand it, is she, Dr. Karen Ash, who again was and I assume right now remains um, Mm well-respected, had these mice that she developed. And um, they basically took these mice and they they took something out of, they were like purified mice and they took something out of these mice and injected it into rats. And those rats who had been perfectly able to find the treat in the maze by going through door two suddenly could no longer remember how to find door two and get the treat. Like they'd been fine on Monday. Then she injected this stuff in them. And then on Tuesday, they couldn't find the treat. 
Is that pedestrian explanation about no, right? that's perfectly okay they isolated these oligomers in this case a very specific one which was a clump of 12 strands of this little tiny beta amyloid protein that they thought was the the silver bullet and they found that when they put it into mice or into rats rather that they could no longer uh, remember as well as they had before and so they were like this is the aha moment that proves to go back to our original uh the opening of our discussion the plaques cause Alzheimer's? It was certainly was an important part of showing that the oligomers uh, contributed to the toxicity. And importantly, which had never been shown, at least robustly before, they showed that the plaque caused memory problems. In the past, that always been a problem with the amyloid hypothesis is that the plaques don't correlate very strongly with memory. By the time patients have memory problems, they have a massive amount of plaques in their brain. And that was the real problem for the hypothesis that this paper started to unravel. Samantha from Arcadia, California, is as excited as I am about GenuCell's transformative results. She says, I love GenuCell plant stem cell therapy. I've used it all over my face, under my eyes, and it cleared up the dry flakiness, even reducing my forehead lines. Someone even asked if I had work done. Nope, just GenuCell, she writes. Thank you. GenuCell has sold over 1 million products to women and men across this country. Fine lines, forehead wrinkles, Dark spots, sagging jawlines, even those annoying bags and puffiness under your eyes, gone without risky or invasive procedures. And with its immediate effects product, there are guaranteed results in as little as 12 hours or your money back. See the difference for yourself with 65% off their most popular packages at GenuCell.com. Right now, their most popular packages, which is all their best products, includes a free month supply of the original GenuCell under eye bags and puffiness treatment. Visit GenuCell.com slash MK. Enter MK at checkout to make sure you get that discount. Order today and get their summer essential dark spot corrector absolutely free. Go to GenuCell.com slash MK60. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash MK60. GenuCell.com slash MK60. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.